Now, I know when I was telling you earlier on about ladies telling a man how to drive, I know there's no women in here like that. No. No, never. My mother-in-law is terrible for it. Tell me where to park, how to park, when to reverse. <laughs> okay. Five questions for you. That everyone in this planet asks at some point or another these five questions. Many people never do anything about it. Many people just live their life, follow their pleasures, follow their flesh, and never really ask the question. So I'm going to ask you five questions, take a note of them, think about them. The first question is, who am I? Who am I? And that speaks about identity. And that's why today in the world we have an identity crisis. People don't know who they are. We have this whole transgender stuff going on. People don't know who they are. They're totally confused. The enemy is bringing so much confusion. And the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 14, 33, God is not the author of confusion. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 33, God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. So wherever there's confusion, it's not God. God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 33. God's a God of order, not disorder. So people are asking the questions, who am I? Second question is, why am I here? What's the reason for my existence? Third question, where am I from? Where am I from? Heaven. Amen. You came from heaven. Let me just comment on that. If we existed in the mind of God our creator before we were created, we came from heaven. The unseen God created you before you were in the womb. And he created you and I to work and have a destiny to bring him glory. Your work is your glory. Amen? Yes. Adam's first commandment was to work. Let them have dominion, rule, and authority over the animals, over the birds, over the fish of the sea. He was called to manage this earth. And most theologies teaching today for our destiny is heaven. Ultimately, our destiny has never been changed because our destiny is the earth. Because God gave the earth to mankind. Genesis 1.26 Let them have dominion, rule and authority. So if God gave the earth to mankind, it's an everlasting promise. When we die, we go to heaven, but ultimately we're coming back to earth. Because the Bible says there'll be a new heavens and a new earth. And we will reign in this earth as the King of Kings. And the Lord of Lords, Jesus, the King. There'll be a new Jerusalem. What was I said there? Genesis 1, Genesis 1, verse 26. Genesis 1, verse 26. That, that, that's such a key scripture when you look at our destiny, because we have, I touched on this, just in case some people missed it last time. I touched on this before because people think God's in total control. And God's not totally in control. 
This planet is controlled by us. That's why it's a mess. <laughs> Let them have dominion, rule, and authority. God just excluded himself. God made himself illegal at that point. <laughs> Let them have dominion, rule, and authority over the birds of the air, over the fish of the sea, over all the animal kingdom, Adam and Eve had dominion, rule, and authority. He gave it to man. He gave it to Adam. And Satan came along and stole it from him. By disobedience, he lost the kingdom. That's why when Satan comes to Jesus in the wilderness and he shows him all the kingdoms of the world, he says, they belong to me. And if you fall down and worship me, I'll give you them. Now that wasn't a lie. Because the Bible says that was a temptation. So Satan became the ruler of this world. The God of this world. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4. He is the God of this world. Jesus called him the Prince of this world. The power of the Prince of this world. We see God's control while babies have been aborted. Women have been raped. Vicious, wicked, evil corruptions happen in this world and we see God's in control. Let them have dominion, rule and authority. He's coming back to wrap it up. Yes, he's in charge. But at this point, he's given us this planet. The Bible says that the earth belongs to God. But he's given dominion to man. Psalm 8. Who's got Psalm 8? We'll come back to these five keys. Psalm 8. Somebody have it? Psalm 8. Verses 5 and 6. What is man that you should be mindful of him? The son of man that you should care for him. Yes, you made him a little lower than the angels. You made him a little lower than the angels. You crowned him with glory. Oh, say that again. You what? You crowned him with glory and honor. Wow. You crowned him with glory and honor. He gave us glory and honor. Is that five and six, Sean? Yes. Sean? Psalm 115, verse 16. Who's got that? Psalm 115 verse 16. What does it say? Heaven belongs to Yahweh, but the earth he has given to you. Hallelujah. Say that again. Heaven belongs to God, but the earth he has given to you. He's given to mankind. That's Psalm 115. Verse 16. Psalm 8, verses 5 and 6. You crowned him with glory. You made him a little lower than the angels. Adam was crowned with glory. Do you know that most scholars believe that when Adam and Eve walked, do you remember the transfiguration? They were transfigured, they were bathed in light. They walked in the glory of God. And when they disobeyed God, the glory lifted and they saw they were naked. And that's why you, when you see Jesus as the new Adam, as the last Adam being transfigured, that's how the first Adam looked, filled with light and shining. He crowned him with glory. And that's why when we get into our destiny and we find out, what we've been called to do in the purpose of our existence, we are crowned with glory and we give glory to God in everything we do. Amen? Amen. Becomes our masterpiece. You go to the Sistine Chapel and you see the glory of Michelangelo everywhere. You know why? Because his work is his glory. It's his masterpiece. Your masterpiece, Beethoven, Symphonies.
The music he wrote was his masterpiece, giving glory to God. Something that touches the human spirit, art and music. Ben Crosby, the biggest selling single ever, I'm Dreaming of a White Christmas. How many people have sat listening to that song and been touched and bring back memories? I'm dreaming of a white Christmas. That was his masterpiece. And all of us have a masterpiece in us. The arts, the crafts, the great buildings of this world showing glory to God. And that's why the church bought land and built cathedrals to show the glory of God. Jesus Christ is King of Kings. You go to St. Patrick's in New York. Have you ever been to St. Patrick's in New York? Oh my the glory, the majesty. What a statement. It's making a statement to the world. Our God is King. He's Lord of Lords. You ever go to the Vatican and you see the glory? All the, all the riches in the, the Vatican and hear all this nonsense getting said. When you go to heaven, you're going to see streets of gold. God is into gold. <laughs> God loves gold. And there's going to be a sea of crystal, the Bible says. And beautiful emeralds and all sorts of precious stones in heaven. God loves his jingle. God's into gold. But our little peanut brains, we want to limit God and bring him down and not accept the majesty and the glory of God in creation. We were crowned with glory. And when we get to heaven, we're going to be shining in glory. We're going to be transfigured. All of us. We're restored to who we really are. And that's why on this planet, if you recognise who you are, where I come from, why I'm here, number four. Let's see what number four is. What keeps me here? What can I do? So we've got who am I? Identity. Where I'm from, your heritage, you're from heaven. Remember, you're not a human being having a spiritual experience. You're a spiritual being having a human experience. Your spirit will live forever in God's presence. And we pamper our flesh for most of our life. If we pampered our spirit as much as we pampered our flesh, we would be saints of the Most High. We would be walking in such power and glory. If we were given attention to the word of God and the principles of God, nothing would be impossible to us. Because we would be on another level of faith and we'd be walking in victory. We'd be understanding God's ways and God's principles. And that's why when David looked to Goliath, he looked from the waist down. I know it's pretty graphic. This man's uncircumcised. Everybody was looking from the waist up. He's nine and a half foot tall. He's a giant. He's going to kill him. He can destroy us. David says he's uncircumcised. He doesn't have a covenant with Almighty God. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? There's goal for you. There's boldness for you. And then runs towards him. This day I'm going to take your head off. I'm going to feed your carcass to the birds of the sky. And Jesus, David takes him out because he starts to walk in faith. He's walking the principles. Why? Because God showed him how to worship. God gave him a work. What was his work? He was a shepherd. A shepherd. He, he, he showed God his glory as a shepherd. But God saw a king as well, King David. A man after my own heart. He knew how to worship. He wrote the Psalms. And that's why I say at men's retreats, men, you have to learn how to worship. Women are great worshippers, but men have to know how to worship. King David was a worshipper and he was a warrior. It's your worship that comes first. It's your worship that makes you a warrior. Because he was looking with eyes of faith. This guy's uncircumcised. He doesn't have a covenant with God. And the whole of heaven was backing him up. Do you know what the armies of the Lord does? Heaven. Now, I'm going to challenge some of our religious thinking here. So buckle up. We talk about ourselves being the army of the Lord. We're citizens of the kingdom. 
the armies of the Lord are the angels. They are the armies of the Lord. They're the army. And they are called to look after us. Hebrews 1 verse 12 says, Are not the angels ministering spirits sent to work on behalf of those who inherit salvation? Who inherits salvation? Us. Angels are sent to serve us. The angels are the army of the Lord. As citizens, we can call, do you know the natural? As a citizen of Ireland, if you see something happen in your neighbourhood, perhaps you see the next door getting burgled or there's violence happen, you can make a call to the guards. And as a citizen of the kingdom, they have to respond to your call. Because you're a citizen. And they have to come and bring order. Because you're a citizen. Are you getting this? Yes. So in the natural, as a citizen, the guards serve you and me. The police. The army. The fire brigade. The service. Respond to the citizens of the kingdom. And so it is in the kingdom of God. The angel of the Lord responds to us. The captain of the heavenly host. Remember in Joshua? The book of Joshua says that the captain of the heavenly host appears before Joshua in all his armor. And Joshua walks up towards him and says, are you for us or are you against us? And the captain of the heavenly host says, neither. Because I'm a captain of the heavenly host. He came to help Joshua. So the army of the Lord's heaven. It's a communion of saints. So the help we can get. We are citizens. And because we're citizens of the kingdom. We've got rights and privileges. Is that too much for you? No. Okay. Well, what? Twelve. Angels are ministering spirits sent to work on our behalf. What can I do? That was the fourth one, wasn't it? What can I do talks about potential. Do you remember what the definition of potential is? Good, good, Sharon. Yeah, you're there. Potential is this. You remember that earlier on the seed? I was showing you the seed. The seed had potential to grow an orange. That's its potential. Because God d designed it with growth in it. But because it didn't comply with the laws, it dies. Okay? The potential in the kingdom for you is what could be, what should be, but does not yet exist. It's potential. Potential. All those people buried in graves today had potential. All those paintings that were never painted, the music was never written, the songs that were never written, the businesses that were never created. Potential. What could be, what should be, but does not yet exist. My father used to say when he see a young boy play, he's got great potential. It could seem as a footballer, wow, he's got potential. It doesn't mean he's made it. He's got potential. My father would tell me stories that during the, the break, when he played with Celtic, that a lot of the players would be away drinking for a good six weeks while they're having a break, and they would all come back with bellies, two stone weight. Because they hadn't been training. My father was on the beach every day, running. Teetotal. Wouldn't take a drink. He's dedicated. I remember he, he told my story, he was in Leeds United with Celtic. And most of the team went to sleep with prostitutes. And he was sitting in the hotel on his own. Dedication. Dedication, dedication. So, so many people can have potential, but they never apply the biblical 
principles to bring them to that potential. They're not in good company. They're not in praise. They're not worshipping. They're not seeking. They're not searching. They're not learning the keys of the kingdom. I'm going to teach you five keys of a good habitual lifestyle that will help you. And we'll finish with that in a minute. Okay? So potential is what could be, what should be, but does not yet exist. Great potential. So sad when you see somebody with great potential that never do anything about it. So many people have got gift, but they've no character. And someday I'll come back and I'll teach you about character. What it means to have character. Because you can have gift, but no character. And your gift will take you to a place that maybe your character would not be able to hold you. That's why so many people make mistakes, because they're gifted. And doors open for them. And opportunities come. Frank Sinatra, the voice, the voice of the 21st century, divorced his wife, ran away with Eva Gardner, a Hollywood beauty. What a voice. No character. The rat pack, drinking, boozing, women. What a voice. What a gift. But his character was so poor, he made so many poor choices. Elvis Presley, what a gift, what a voice. He learned how to dance in the Pentecostal church. Remember, he was shaking those hips at Sunday service. That's how he learned to dance. What a voice. Good looking, he had everything. No character. Died in a toilet seat. That's how he died. Taking drugs and uppers and downers and all sorts of pills. His body was pumped full of drugs. Potential. Michael Jackson. Moon dance. It's amazing to call Elvis the king of rock and roll. Do you know that one day, this is a true story that he was in Vegas at one point and he looked out at the crowd and all these young girls had put up Elvis as the king and he stopped through the song and says no, Jesus Christ is the king so there was an investment in Elvis from those early Pentecostal days that he recognised Jesus is the king but can you imagine having that charisma those good looks that voice and all the attention and all the women that would come to him and all the men that would feed his ego. Sorry? Did he really? There you go. And have you ever listened to any of his gospel records when he sang the gospel? He actually sang about the rosary. Beautiful song, the holy rosaries. Elvis singing. Beautiful. I heard a song, a story once that one of his team, who was a, became a pastor, came and said to him, Elvis, have you ever heard how great thou art? Yeah. Do you know the story? And he said, no, what's that? And he gave him the music. He says, I think you should try and learn that. You love it. But he was a Pentecostal boy. How great thou art probably wouldn't be sung in those places. They're probably singing new contemporary music. And a couple of weeks later, that pastor came back and he was sitting at the table, the piano, singing How Great the Lord. Have you ever heard him sing it? Wow. He didn't have the character. His character hadn't fully developed to maintain that gift. And that's why we have to work in our character and in our integrity. As we were saying, if you're working and you don't like that job, you work with integrity. And you do the best job you can because we're people of integrity, people of character. And that's why so many people make so many mistakes. David, 
was a man after his own heart, God's own heart, be lacked in character. He made a lot of wrong decisions. He took one look at Bathsheba bathing and had to have her. Had to have sex with her. I have to have her. And then tries to kill her husband, Uriah. Read the story. Uriah the Hittite, her husband, has him up the front and gets him killed in battle and then takes Bathsheba, a man who was after God's own heart. He never had the character to realise. Solomon, the wisest man that ever lived. And he had such wisdom, but in the later years, he never matured in his character. He took 700 wives. 700 wives, can you imagine, men? One. One's enough. And 300 concubines, that's the Hebrew word for mistresses. No character. But such wisdom. And that's why if we can get the wisdom of God and the principles of God and the character of God to hold us, to contain that gift that was, that's within us, we can do great things. That's why some of the greatest criminals in the world have got such great vision. Like the mafia. <laughs> Honour. Respect. Kissing you and then I'll put a bullet in your brain two days later. <laughs> a lot of it's based in honour and respect. You show me no respect. <laughs> but it gets twisted. No character. Are you with me? Yes. Okay. Your last one. When am I going? The fifth one. When am I going? Who am I? Why am I here? Where am I from? What can I do? Potential. Where am I going? That's your destiny. Amen? Amen. Are you with me? Yes. Are you okay with character? Yes. Are you understand the character? Yes. Amen? Amen? I often say about Bathsheba, she should have been called, don't have a Bathsheba. <laughs> that caused all the problems. Don't have a Bathsheba. Wow, that's a great question. Character is formed by obedience to God's principles. That builds your character. Character is who you are when nobody's looking. <laughs> Change your mindset. We'll come to that in a minute. What you do is you create a habitual lifestyle that will develop your character. Do you want to know what the habitual lifestyle is? Okay. Five keys to a successful habitual lifestyle. Number one, what you think. Doesn't change really much for what I've been teaching. Number one, what you think. You are what you think. Not what you eat. Ultimately, you become what you eat. But you think it before you eat it. Number one, take control of your mind. Take control of your thoughts. You're not the problem. Your mind's the problem. <laughs> Change your thinking, and we can do it. Flick a switch. When that lustful thought, flick a switch. When that fearful thought, flick a switch. When that bad attitude and judgmental thought, flick a switch. Think of it as a switch in your mind. Remember I shared with you before, the last time I was here, I think it was the last time I was here, I was sharing about that movie, Gone with the Wind, remember? Scarlet O'Hara, remember Scarlet O'Hara? And she used to always say, I choose not to think of these things today. She's like a spoiled brat. But I always remember she's brushing her long black hair. 
I choose not to think of these things today. And I remember thinking, wow, that's, that's biblical. That's actually pretty awesome that she's saying that. And you can develop a, a lifestyle to think, I choose not to think of these things today. I continually say to my wife, why are you mentioning something that can never be changed? Why spend energy on something that you cannot change? If only we'd done this and if we'd bought this house and maybe if we had that job and maybe... It's over. What's the point? I choose not to think of those things today. If you were to go over your life, I should have, could have, would have. You'll be here all day, you'll be demented. But you have a promise. Romans 8, 28. God works all things together for the good. For those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. Isn't that amazing? That God could work all things together for the good. That that very adultery that David committed with Bathsheba, that Bathsheba and David bring forth the Messiah. Wow. Solomon was a child of David and Bathsheba. And Bathsheba, Bathsheba and David are the lineage of Christ. Whew. God can work all things together for the good. You may have committed adultery with this woman. You may have killed her husband, David, but I'm going to turn this to good. And Bathsheba is going to be the first queen of Israel. Do you know that? Do you know in, the, in biblical times, the wife of the king was not the queen? Else Solomon would have 700 queens. Can you imagine the confusion then? Solomon had 700 wives. But in biblical times, the wife was not the queen. Guess who was the queen? The mother of the king was the queen. And Bathsheba was a foresight of the Blessed Mother. Because the Blessed Mother was going to be the mother of the king. She's the queen mother. And Bathsheba was the first queen mother. Study it, First Kings chapter 2. When Bathsheba walked into the court of, De of Solomon, the Bible says that Solomon got up and he bowed down before her and says, bring my mother a throne. And she sat beside him. And he said to her, ask me anything, my mother. I won't refuse you. Does that sound a bit familiar? That's what the Blessed Mother was doing at the wedding feast of Cana. They have no more wine. She's a queen mother. And in biblical times, the queen mother was an advocate for the people. See, the Catholic Church just didn't invent the Blessed Mother being the Queen of Heaven and the Queen of the Apostles and the Queen of the Church. They didn't just decide, we'll make it. It's all based in biblical history. Because the mother of the king was the queen. So when the angel Gabriel came to the Blessed Mother and said, your son, Jesus, you'll call him Jesus, Jesus and he'll take over the throne of his father, David, she knew then, I'm going to be a queen. Do you get that? Yeah. That even with all that mess, God can work all things together for the good. So don't go over your past mistakes and don't go around the cul-de-sacs you made because God can turn them to good. That's how he operates. That's amazing, isn't that? That God can turn all things together for the good for those who love him. Okay. So the number one key to a habitual lifestyle is what you think. I have a teaching on my website, on my YouTube cha uh, uh, channel, called Battle for the Mind. I would encourage you to go get it. If you want me to get it, I can forward to the Carmel, and Carmel can maybe form a, for, forward it to the group. That teaching, Battle for the Mind, will change your life. 
The battle for the mind, that's where it begins, between your eyes, between your ears. Amen? Amen. 50,000 thoughts a day come to you. Some say 80. But even at 50, that's a lot of thoughts coming to you. And if you don't win over that battle for that mind and, and really develop a habitual lifestyle, that's not my thought. Living in them, yeah, absolutely, and be so alert that training your mind saying, I don't believe, I'm not thinking that, I choose not to think that. That's not my thought, absolutely. You have to be so on the alert because the devil is relentless. You have to protect your environment, which is our mind. Our mind. What you think. As a man thinks, so is he. Proverbs 23, verse 7. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. You are what you think. That's the number one rule of an habitual lifestyle. Get your mind right. Remember how I started? Check up from the neck up. Remember? Transformation comes with the transforming of your thinking. Be renewed. Transform your life. Don't conform any longer to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Keep renewing your mind. That's why I go to sleep every night, listen to teaching, listen to worship. Do you know that scientists believe that even while you're asleep, your subconscious mind is still being programmed? Your conscious mind's gone, you're dreaming you're gone, but that subconscious mind, maybe you've got two minds, the conscious mind, and that subconscious mind can still be programmed while you're sleeping. That's why sometimes I preach and I bring things out and I think, where did that come from? I don't even know where it came from. It's probably a teaching I was listening to when you're preaching. Amen? Sometimes I preach that good. I want to take notes. Because <laughs> it's like revelation to me. Where did that come from? Where did it come from? The Lord is downloading them. It's a lifestyle. A lifestyle of thinking and studying and renewing my mind. I don't have time for this stuff. I don't have time to listen to watch movies with sex. I have time for this. Get out of this. I want to listen to this. I don't want to watch this silly, childish, immature stuff. I want to feed my mind. Feed my spirit. Okay, principle number two. This is for a habitual lifestyle. What you speak. Number, three. number two. Number one. I thought two was taking control of your thoughts. That's number one. Number one, taking control of your thoughts still is what you think. Okay. So what you think is number one. Number two is what you speak. Everything in God's kingdom begins with the word, the spoken word, the distomas, remember, the two-mouthed, the mouth of God speaking the word and the word speaking through you, what you speak. Proverbs 18 and 21, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Death and life. There's power every time you open your mouth. You have a miracle in your mouth. Amen? Amen. Do you remember the last time I was saying here, some people say, oh, I, I, I can't do any healing ministry. Proverbs 16, 24 says that kind words, kind words are like honey, sweet to the soul, and healthy to the bones. You speak kind words, you can bring healing to somebody. You have a miracle in your mouth. And that's why the devil wants your tongue. He wants you speaking death. Oh, I'm going to die of a heart attack. Don't say that. Don't ever say that. Oh, my father died. Don't you ever say that. I will live a long life. 
Speak life over your body. Speak life over your family. Don't ever say your children's a no user. You see how the women of Israel speak to their children? Compare it to other women in other nations and other mothers. Italian mothers just want to feed them spaghetti. Make sure they get plenty of eating. A Hebrew, Hebrew mother says you're going to be the greatest. You're going to be the greatest. You're going to be a rabbi. You're going to be an astronaut. You're going to be she's putting faith into them. Whatever you speak over your children, be very careful. Whatever you speak over your husband. And women, when your husband's driving, <laughs> whatever you speak. Okay, you got that? Yes. Principle number three. What you hear. What you hear. Be careful with what you hear. Mark 4. Who's got Mark 4, 23 and 24? Mark 4, 23 and 24. Somebody got that? Oh, pay attention to what you hear. Say it again, Sharon. Listen then, if you have ears. And he also said to them, pay attention to what you hear. Keep going. In the measure you give, so shall you receive. And still more will be given to you. Mm-hmm. Be at, pay attention to what you hear. Romans ten seventeen. Faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. So if you don't hear the word of God, you don't have any faith. And that's why it's so important to hear God's word. Be careful what you hear. If you're surrounding yourself with people that are constantly blaspheming God, you're going to have to start putting boundaries up. You're going to have to stand and take your place. And that's what I had to do in that bank. You want to tell a sleazy joke, son? Let me know, because I'm out of here. I'm not prepared to hear that stuff I'm a man of God I'm not prepared to listen to it be careful what you hear because it can take in and change your life before you know it okay the book of Revelation the Bible talks about the seven churches that Jesus speaks to and in every church he says this those who have an ear hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Those who have an ear hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. What is the Spirit saying to you in your situation, in your family, in this ministry? What is the Holy Spirit saying to you? Those who have an ear, again, remember, this is your spiritual ear. You have to develop spiritual sight. You walk by faith, not by physical sight. Sight is the enemy of vision. Remember, vision is a function of the heart. Be careful with what you hear. Next one. What you see. This is a fourth key for a habitual lifestyle. What you see. What are you looking at? The Bible says that the eyes are the lamp of the body. If the eyes are pure, then the body is full of light. Do you know the Job? Job. Job said this, and Job was such a holy man that God was boasting about him to Satan. Have you considered my servant Job? Do you know that Job writes this? I made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully upon a woman. Whew. He made a covenant with his eyes. I'm not going to look at a woman because she looks sexy. I am going to make a covenant with my eyes not to look at her in that way. 
I'm going to train my eyes to look at her as a precious sister of the kingdom. Now that's a whole different lifestyle. And it works both ways. Women can look lustfully upon men as well. Make a covenant in your eyes. That's why the pornographic industry is going crazy at the moment. You just have to lift your phone and there's pop-ups stuff. A lot of young boys are totally crippled with pornography. False images. Nonsense. What nonsense. They're caught up in that because of what they see. What they're looking at. These iPhones scroll and scroll and scroll and people addicted to Facebook. I know a woman, she starts about 8, eight o'clock at night and about 5 or 6 in the morning she's on Facebook. She's totally addicted to Facebook. And then she looks up friends. And then she looks to friends of the friends. And then friends of the friends of the friends of the friends. <laughs> totally addicted to Facebook. I said to her, why don't get your Bible and get your face in that book? And that will change your life. Get your face in the book. The book. That's what Bible means, you know that? The book. Biblios. The book. The book of books. Facebook, Instagram. I remember somebody told me, oh, you need to download TikTok. You love this TikTok, it's good. I downloaded it and deleted it within minutes. Full of half-naked young girls. I don't want to look at that. I'm not going to look at that. Yet in mixed amongst it all, there's some good stuff. There's some preachers on there preaching stuff. I'm not going to even take the chance. I don't want to look at that. Careful what you look at. Eyes. Make a covenant with your eyes. Say that over the weekend, Lord. I want to make a covenant with my eyes. A covenant. Yeah, come and say it. Good for you. Stand up. Okay, Lord God. Lord God. I make a covenant with my eyes. Lord God, Lord God, I make a covenant, make a covenant with, my eyes. with my eyes. Cause me to see purity. Cause me to see love. Protect me from what I see. Today, Today I, make a I make a covenant with my eyes. With my eyes. In the presence of of the saints, of the saints in, heaven in heaven and on earth. And on earth. Amen. Amen. That's a good declaration. Amen? Amen? Okay, one more. The fifth principle of a habitual lifestyle is what you do. What you do. James 1 verse 22 Sharon, can you try and get that? James 1, verse 22. There's people can talk the talk, but don't walk the walk. It's easy to talk the talk, but don't walk the walk. I've been in the company with pastors across the world, and I've been with some serious Bible teachers at conferences, and I've seen them behind the scenes different people that's why I said last time the secret to being a saint is to be a saint in secret what do you do when nobody sees you what's your lifestyle like there's no condemnation here I'm not bringing any condemnation to anybody I'm just saying is to be a saint in secret the secret to be a saint is to be a saint in secret. It's what you do. Make a stand. Put up boundaries. I'm not willing to hear this. I'm not willing to see this. And you need to take a stand sometimes. I remember at one point I was living in Bradford and all the young people in this church, they wanted me to go to this movie with them. And I said, yeah, I'll go along. I love a movie. 
Within 10 minutes, I'm gone. They were laughing. They were joking. They were young Christians. Some of them were musicians and worship leaders. They thought this was, this was hilarious. But all it was was sexual innuendo and wicked, evil. I don't listen to this. I said, sorry guys, I'm off. Oh, what's wrong? I don't listen to this. I'm not prepared to listen to this. What you do. So what you hear, what you see, what you think, and what you do. James 1, 22. Now listen to the scripture very carefully and let the word do its work with you. James 1, verse 22. Sharon. No, 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 no. Too much revelation in there. Say it again. Be doers of the word and not just hearers, lest you deceive yourselves. So you be deceived if you're just a hearer. Do not just be a hearer of the word and be deceived. But do what it says. Do what the word says. Many people are hearing but they're not doing. And they're deceived. Many people going to Mass and Sundays are hearing, but they're not doing. They voted on abortion. They voted on same-sex marriage. Mass going Catholics. Hearing, but not doing. That's a whole different ballgame. These are five keys for a good habitual lifestyle. And remember I said to you, whatever you give attention to, you will desire. You give attention to the word of God, I'm telling you, you're going to wake up in the morning, you can't get enough of it. You start giving attention and read the Proverbs every day and read your Psalms and take a book of the Bible and study it and take what you can through in life if it's, if it's fear, if it's people antagonizing you, go to the scripture and ask the Lord to show you how to overcome fear. Look up every scripture and fear. Look up every scripture and worry. And go to it, take time and read it. Because it's not so much as reading the Bible, it's the Bible reading you. This is a supernatural book. A young man said to me, eh, it was written by men. Yeah, how come men don't understand it? Because <laughs> it's a supernatural book. Your eyes have to be opened. To experience and know the word of God and the power of God's word. It's a supernatural book. Amen? Amen? And when we don't have these lifestyles in place, remember the last time I said to you, thoughts become words. Do you remember that? Yeah. Will I repeat it again? Yeah. Thoughts become words. Words lead to action. Action develops habit. Habit develops your character. And your character will lead you to your destiny. I'll say it again. Thoughts become words. You just have to have a conversation with somebody and you know what they're thinking. Because words are an expression of your thoughts. Amen? Just listen to something, listen to what they're talking, and you're not thinking. Thoughts become words, and your words lead to action. Your action, the more you do something, will develop a habit. And if you develop these five keys, these habitual keys, your habit will develop your character. And your character will lead you to your destiny. So everything began with thoughts. If you think of a bookend 
thoughts and destiny. Starts there. You want to get to your destiny, get your thoughts right. Everything comes back to this battle for the mind. And you win the battle for the mind, you win the battle for words. Because you can train your speech. Let me say something to you. You will get so many thoughts during the day, but let them die unborn. Unborn. Because when you speak them out, you give life to them. <coughs> Death and life are in the power of the tongue. So thoughts will come. We can't stop thoughts coming. The devil's relentless. But let them die unborn. Which means I'm not going to speak that out. Fear may come. Worry may come. Don't you dare speak it out. Don't you say, I'm afraid. <laughs> Don't you dare. Because you know what happens? Your flesh will obey that. And before you know it, you'll be trembling. Let it die unborn. Do you know that in your mind, to date, you've either housed within your mind, there's only two people, are two voices within you. We call it the mind voice in theology. The mind voice can either be the mind of Satan and the thoughts of Satan in your mind or your thoughts or somebody's opinion. Don't let the opinion become your reality. So those thoughts that come to you, you have to be aware how to overcome them and how to be aware that God is showing you a way of developing a lifestyle of overcoming those thoughts. And that's why a lot of psychologists and psychotherapists say this, you either house within your mind a critic or a coach. And let me tell you, of our 64 years being on this planet, most people are housing a critic. It's a lifestyle. Many people have a lifestyle of just questioning everything. They'll criticize no matter what you say. They'll oppose it. I remember my mum and dad, they used to fight and argue all the time. My mother says, I've never had a decent conversation with your daddy in all my life. If I say it's going to be a nice day, he'll say, I think it's going to rain. <laughs> or if I say it's going to rain, he says, no, no, I think, I think the sun's going to break out. And sometimes people have a lifestyle, no matter what you say. It's actually called Opposition disorder. <laughs> it's actually a disorder. I could preach all day and the majority of people go, wow, that was amazing. Just one person comes up and says, I'm not sure about this. Opposition disorder. It's a disorder. So, sorry? Tip for tip for yeah. And people have that bent towards them. They just, they will see the bad things. It's the half glass scenario, you know, that's it. It's either half full or half empty. Most people, it's half empty. Most people don't think positive. It's negative. Because for years, they've had a habitual lifestyle of housing a critic in your mind. You wake up in the morning, you've hardly got to the shower, and you're suicidal. You'll never make it today. Oh, I think they're going to sack you tomorrow. That job, see that business you're thinking of creating? Never going to work. And all this stuff 
is coming at you, that critical voice. I don't think you're going to live very long. Your mother had cancer. Your brother had cancer. Do you know I've lost all my family to cancer? Half of them. My brother Brian died at 46 with cancer. My sister Rosemary, 55. My brother Johnny, 64. Mark, two weeks ago, was alcoholic, but he had cancer. Cancer's not coming near me. It's not my heritage. By his stripes, I am healed. So as soon as that thought comes to me, no, 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 I ain't having cancer. Cancer doesn't belong to me. God doesn't give you cancer. He doesn't have it to give it. Amen? Amen. So you have to get to the point where you train your mind to be a coach. To say, yes, you can do that. Yes, you can start that business. Yes, you can change your location. Yes, God's going to bless you. Yes, you maybe marry, you'll marry again. Yes, you've got a future full of hope and purpose and have a coach in your mind. Now, that's a whole different ballgame. And many, many, many people don't have a coach. The mind's gone all the time. You'll never, you'll never, you'll never. And when you train your mind to be so switched on to this, to identifying that thought, remember? Recognize, rebuke, and replace. Recognize that thought. Be sharp as a razor. That is not my thought. Get behind me, Satan. Remember Jesus says, who do the people say I am? Remember that? Who do the people? If you walked out here and asked people in the restaurants, in the pubs, in the supermarkets, who do you say Jesus is? There's some amount of responses you'll get. The apostles, oh, well, some say you're John the Baptist and, and Jeremiah and, and one, one of the prophets. And Jesus said, okay, who do you? You see, in the, Jew, the Jewish mindset, it was all about tribes and communities and believing what the crowd believed. And they were actually trying to impress Jesus. John the Baptist, Elijah, Jeremiah, these are pretty good prophets. Okay, you've heard the crowd. What do you say? He takes it from the plural to the singular. Who do you? Never mind what your mother says, or your husband, or your daughter, or your niece or nephew, who do you say I am? Only one man, thou art the Christ, the Son of a living God. What an answer. What an answer. Again, like the Roman centurion, Jesus is taking a black. Simon, son of Jonah, Flesh and blood's not revealed this to you. But my Father in heaven, and thou art Kephas, thou art a rock. And upon the rock of this revelation, I'm going to build my church. Peter heard from God. Thoughts of God. And within a few minutes, Jesus says, I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to suffer and be handed over and be crucified. And Peter says, oh, no, 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 no. no. That's not going to happen to you. And Jesus turns and says, get behind me, Satan. One minute is the rock, and the next minute is Satan. Now watch this. Thoughts of men, thoughts of God, thoughts of Satan. And Jesus recognized by what he said, what manner of a spirit they were speaking through. Do you get that? I'll say it again. Thoughts of men. Thoughts of God. Thoughts of Satan. Your thoughts become words. So they spoke for human thoughts. Thoughts of men. Well, the men say you're Jeremiah or you're John the Baptist. Okay. Who do you? Thoughts of God. Simon. Flesh and blood's not revealed. My father, thoughts of God. My father's revealed this to you. And within minutes, thoughts of Satan. Get behind me, Satan. And remember the last time I spoke to you. You know where I'm going with this. Maybe you missed it the last time. You're not going to miss it this time. 
That teaching tells me every time you speak, a spirit speaks. Every time you speak, it's either your human spirit, the Holy Spirit, or a demonic spirit. Now that's powerful. Every time you speak, a spirit speaks. Either your human spirit, the Holy Spirit, or a demonic spirit. That's why it's so important what you speak. Jesus recognized by what manner of spirit that he was speaking through by his words. Thou art the Christ, the Son of of the loving God, Jesus knew. That's the Holy Spirit. That's my Father. My Father's revealed us to you. And then within minutes, no, you're not going to Jerusalem, Lord. You're not, that's not going to happen to you. Get behind me, Satan. He knew by his words what spirit was speaking through him. Amen? Amen. Did you learn anything? Yes. Is that okay? You've got a question? Yes. The human spirit is our spirit itself. We have a spirit. We possess a soul and we live in a body. So our human spirit can speak the opinions of men. It's not necessarily a godly spirit. It's not necessarily the Holy Spirit or a demonic spirit. It's just opinions. So it's just your human spirit speaking. They spoke what men said. Thoughts of men, thoughts of God and thoughts of Satan. Who do the people say I am? Who do the people? Thoughts of men. Who do you see? They were the Christ. Thoughts of God. You're not going to Jerusalem to suffer Jesus. Thoughts of Satan. Stopping him from going to the crucifixion. So they ask the Holy Spirit to speak to you all the time. Amen. Ask the Holy Spirit to speak to you. Let those who have an ear hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. The, start, the starting point is conversion. The starting point is the gospel. The starting point is the surrender of the heart to Jesus Christ as Lord and Saviour. That's why there's no point, you, no point bringing anybody in to listen to what I'm teaching if they've never surrendered their life to Christ. I may as well talk to the wall. Why? Because it's an unconverted heart. How do I know that? John 3, Nicodemus. He comes to Jesus. In the night time, when it was dark, so that nobody could recognize him, he was a Pharisee. He was a member of the Sanhedrin. He was well respected. Jesus says, Nicodemus, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom. Unless a man is born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Unless a man is truly converted, he can't see it. That's why when I'm asked opinions by ungodly people about politics and last week's vote and stuff like that, I'll always going to say to them, well, the opinion I'm going to come from is a biblical worldview. You come from a political worldview or a scientific worldview or an atheistic worldview. So my worldview is a biblical worldview. You talk about being politically correct. I want to be biblically correct. Because a lot of the political correctness is not biblical correctness. So Unless they are truly converted, that's why we have to preach the gospel. 
Most people don't know the gospel. Do you want me to tell you what the gospel is? Four hours. Four hours. Write down four hours. One after another. The first R is relationship. God created us for relationship, for fellowship, right in the very beginning of Genesis. Relationship. God wants a relationship with every human person walking on this planet, but he gave them free choice. You love me. Choose this day whom you shall serve. Choose life or death. Choose life. So the first number one R of the call, they call it the kerygma, the Greek word for the gospel. You talk to somebody, you tell them God loves you. God created your life with a purpose. Where do you think you came from? What's your life about? Where do you think you're going? Ask these questions, these five questions I asked you. Because most people do think them. Every person that goes to a funeral, they do think. Is there a heaven? That's why when I was a pastor, I loved to preach at funerals. I tell you, it breaks my heart a lot, the funerals I've been since I come back to the Catholic Church. You'd think it was a canonization. Everybody's going to heaven. And I don't mean the judgment in the last the ten. God, God alone knows who's going to heaven. But I've been to some funerals and I know they're rascals. And they were God haters. And the priest's making them out is like he's Padre Pio. Canonization. I used to preach at funerals and I'd stick it, let's look, look to the, the coffin. And I say, if your mother was here, if your granny was here, what do you think she would be saying to you? Because she knows all the answers now. She knows really there's a heaven and there's a hell. And she'd be screaming at you, make sure you get to heaven, repent. What an opportunity to, re- to preach the gospel to so many people who are coming to the, with these questions going through their mind. There is a heaven. And maybe there's a hell. But we make it so easy for them that everybody's going to heaven. It's called universalism. We're all going to heaven. It's not what the Bible teaches. Sorry. Sorry? What happens if a priest says that the person is good? Yeah. But do they really know exactly what they're doing in their life? They don't. They don't know. That's why it has to be a truthful preaching of the word, a, a, a funeral. What an opportunity to tell people about heaven and hell. I remember saying, one, and I'll tell you, I remember saying, uh, your granny she was, was a godly woman and a lot of you are saying I'll see you in heaven granny no you won't unless you're born again unless you repent and give your life to Jesus you won't see your granny in heaven that's the good news it's not bad news it's good news and the good news number one R relationship number two R is rebellion Man rebelled against God. We don't need you, God. We can have our own God. We'll do life the way we want to. That's your second R. The third R is redemption. God sent Jesus, the King of Kings, to pay the price for you. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, the Bible says. All of us, all of us are sinners. God's a holy God. But you know what? God had a plan for you. God wants relationship. You rebelled. You're a sinner. You don't have to tell people they're sinners. Most people know. I know I'm a sinner. You're a sinner. In the judgment seat of God, you deserve hell. But guess what? The good news is Jesus came. And he died on the cross for you. All you have to do is accept him as your Lord and Savior. That's the fourth R is your response. Responding to the gospel. And if you don't hear the gospel, they're never going to respond to it. God loves you. You rebelled. The wages of sin is death. 
But God came in the person of his son Jesus and died on the cross for you. He paid the price. That's what redemption means. He bought you back. What's your response? Will you say yes to him? Will you say yes to the Savior? That's the kerygma. That's what you preach to your family and friends. The four hours. Sin. Sin is rebellion against God and against God's ways. Mankind has been living in rebellion from the beginning of time. And God is reaching out and reaching out and reaching out and raising up prophets and raising up Moses and giving them the law, giving them the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments were not the Ten Suggestions. <laughs> or the Ten Invitations. The Commandments. And it's a commandment. If you just love your life like that, you'll be blessed. Honor your mother and your father. Love the Lord your God with love your neighbor. Don't steal. Don't commit adultery. Don't cover your neighbor's wife. These are commandments. God gave them a code of living and they couldn't even keep them. King David probably broke every one of them. It's what theologians call concupiscence. It's sin that loves in us. Remember the last time I was here, the Apostle Paul in Romans 7. Who will free me from this body of death? The things I want to do, I do not do. The things that I do, I do not want to do. It's in us. We can't save ourselves. That's why we need a saviour. And that's why Jesus came and did it for us. Isn't that amazing? You can't do it, I'll do it for you. What a glorious gospel. That's why the Apostle Paul calls it a glorious gospel. It's good news. The Spirit of the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. To bind up the broken heart, to set the captives free. That's what Jesus came to do. And reverse everything the first Adam did with his rebellion. Sickness and disease and corruption entered the world because of man's rebellion. And Jesus came back and redeemed us. What's your response? The fourth R. Now they respond. That's the gospel. That's the glorious gospel. And most Catholics have never heard what I've just said. Everybody's going to heaven. I think if I was Jesus, I'd be going to the Father saying, well, what was all that about? The passion of the Lord, Gethsemane and the crushing, the sweating of blood. And people can live a lifestyle and reject Christ. And they're going to heaven. That's a false gospel. That's a lie from the pits of hell. And that's why God wants you and me to rise up in these days and bring the truth and fulfill your destiny. Amen. Amen. Any comments? Any questions? Tomorrow, there'll be 10 questions I'm going to ask you which will help you discover your destiny. Then this is going to be a process to discover your destiny. It's not going to happen overnight. But once you start to go upon that search and say, I'm going to find this, I'm going to have a destiny. Remember I said the other on, your destiny might be to be a giver in the kingdom. If you've got wealth, give it into the kingdom. I found my destiny. Those men that travelled with that man all these years ago, they had their king badges, the key. I'm a king. I'm a king. I travel with Dr. Cole. I pay all the bills. And they'd be fighting about who was paying the bills. They loved it. What's that? I was fighting to buy the round. Yeah, if we had that in the kingdom. No, I'll pay it. You put your money in your pocket. I'll pay it. If we had that in the kingdom... We wouldn't have to worry about any finance. But there's people in the kingdom that have got finance and never realised that's what I've been called to do. I've got a business. I've got more than just the not enough. I've got more than enough. So I'm going to be 
a person that flows money into the kingdom. And I'll tell you, when you start to do that, your business will prosper. And you'll be blessed beyond words, more than you'll ever, ever imagine. That's what the Bible says in Ephesians 3.20. Do you know that? God can give you far more greater than you think or even imagine. God is able. Ephesians 3 verse 20. God is able to give you much more than you can think, ask for, or even imagine. If you came before the Lord and said, the Lord says, ask whatever you want, you'd undersell yourself. The Lord would say, is that all you wanted? I had this for you. I had so much more for you. Remember restoration? The biblical definition is to give you far greater than you had before. Amen. Amen. I'm finishing now. Okay? See you tomorrow, one o'clock, and we'll finish with our ten questions. Unless anybody's got any questions or comments, I'm happy to take them if you want. Are you okay? You're okay. Okay, God bless. See you tomorrow.